And now we have a speaker this morning who is perennially youthful and proclaims peace to every land. And you'll hear new expressions and new ideas about new thought. So I suggest you put on your thinking caps, take out your notepads, because he's going to make you think. Please help me welcome Reverend Michael. I thank you, ma'am. Good morning, friends. A hearty welcome to you here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, on this absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning. As I look out there, I see someone taking pictures. When we finish, we should all go take pictures at evening our mind. Greetings, too, to those listening via the World Wide Web. Please say after me, God will take care of you through every day in every way. God will take care of you in every day. Through every day in every way. God will take care of you. 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 And I want you to remember those lines. You'll be tested later. <laughs> Nowadays, when people ask me how I am, I say, wonderful and getting better. I picked up the wonderful with an exclamation sign, by the way, from Reverend John. He also says it. And I got the and getting better phrase from a recent BBC program. I've also got into the habit of saying to the universe aloud several times a day, thank you, God, for my many blessings. I say it any time something in the environment causes me a surge of joy. I might be walking through my gate to enter my home, taking a morning walk and seeing the blue sky and the sea in the distance and the hills around my home, taking a deep breath of morning air when I go out on my patio or driving into the colorful, peaceful grounds of this center. Little things, really. Listening to that list, you might be thinking that I'm a pretty happy fellow, and I am. My life is great. I am fulfilled in the five basic needs of mankind generally. They are the need for health, the need for abundance, the need for loving relationships, the need for self-expression, and the need for a conscious working relationship with a higher power. Those are the five basic needs. All, unders, all others come under those headings. So I thank you, God, for my many blessings. Do you know that just now, as I uttered that expression of gratitude, something moved in universal mind. There was a little shift in my favor. The way that my wife shifts in bed, even in deep sleep, when I nudge her away from my side of the bed. Her, she's always over my side. Her automatic response in deep sleep, she's not conscious of it, is just like the universe's automatic response just now, as it set up itself, as I expressed that, ex gave that expression of gratitude. It set up itself to give me a blessing. How do I know 
That is how the universe works. It responds to the feeling behind any thought that you drop into it, like a pool responds to a pebble tossed in. Can't help it. Feel a surge of gratitude for something, and the universe shifts around its parts in order to give you something else to be grateful for. Or feel a surge of anger, like in traffic when somebody bad drives you, and the universe again shifts around to give you more to be angry about. That is how the universe works. If I let go this book, it will fall. And it's only 600 years ago, somebody, Isaac Newton, put a word to it. We knew before that, that it would fall. Isaac Newton put a name, he said gravity. That's how the universe works. Of course, you can cancel the effects of the first feeling by quickly replacing it with its opposite. By the way, that willingness of the universe to forget your past negative thoughts and give you a blessing instead is what is called the grace of God. If you ever wondered what exactly it means, that is it. The tendency of the universe to just forget your past, whatever it was, and give you a blessing. But enough about you. Back to me and my happiness. Question. Am I happy because my needs are met? Or are my needs met because I'm happy? Which came first? Now, because this talk is focused on happiness, the title is actually, Don't Worry, Be Happy, or Else. <laughs> because of that, I won't bore you with the details of the unhappy years of my life. The important thing is that my life started becoming wonderful when I started coming to this church. It's about 18 years ago. The skeptic among you might say that the two events, my becoming happy and my coming to the church, are merely coincidental. I say there is a causal connection. Let me take you back 18 years. During the first discussion segment, I'm sorry, but during the discussion segment of my first Tuesday evening service, and those of you who come to Tuesday evening services, when we have them every Tuesday evening, starting at six, will know that there is a discussion segment. During that discussion segment, I started whining about my pre problems to Reverend Lumsden. She later became doctor. And she firmly told me in front of everybody, shaming me completely, to stop groveling and to take control of my life. But then, being ignorant of the science of mind teachings, I had no idea how to do that. On a subsequent visit, she told somebody to give me a copy of Working with the Law by Raymond Hollywell. It was either Janet or Anne, not sure which, but I remember the person asking Reverend Lovins then if she meant that they should sell me the book. She said, no, give it to him. The book then cost $330. I'd say it was a good investment on her part. <laughs> For me, the book was worth thousands, and I do mean thousands, tens of thousands. It opened my eyes to another world. 
a new way of thinking about life. It is not an exaggeration to say that I was born again. The phrase is commonplace, you hear it all the time, but it refers to a very real experience. My sort of life transforming experience and the one that Saul on the road to Damascus. You'll, you'll remember he was struck blind by a light from above and heard a voice from the heavens telling him to stop persecuting Christians. You know the story. That experience is what Jesus referred to when he said that to get to the kingdom of God, you must be born again. By the way, what does the phrase kingdom of God mean? In my words, it means being peaceful, loving, happy, and more specifically, feeling the presence of God in your life. Ralph Waldo Emerson refers to it more poetically. He says, I quote, hidden away in the inner nature of the real man is the law of his life, and someday he will discover it and consciously make use of it. He will heal himself, make himself happy and prosperous, and live in an entirely different world, the kingdom of God. For he will have discovered that life is from within and not from without." Unquote. I recommend working with the law to everyone interested in how to use the spiritual laws of the universe to guide their lives. I'll just read you some of the chapter titles to give you an idea. It refers to the law of thinking, the law of supply, how to get more, the law of attraction, how to attract things that you want into your life, the law of receiving, the law of increase, the law of compensation, the law of non-resistance, turn the other cheek, the law of forgiveness, important chapter, the law of sacrifice, you got to give to get, the law of obedience, and it ends with that overarching law, the law of success. If it's not in the book room, please ask Reverend Anne to order you a copy. Very important book. It was my first book, as I said. Oh, I also recommend going to classes. Classes give you the nurturing that you will need after your rebirth. You know all babies need nurturing. That's what the classes do. Now, when I tell people that I'm wonderful and getting better, there are usually two types of reactions. The glass is half full types are pleased and a little amused by what I say. But the glass is half empty types, they frown disapprovingly. They expected me to say I'm barely surviving for the island is going to hell in a handbasket. Those two answers represent the two types of people that there are in this world, the optimists and the pessimists. You can actually choose which type you want to be. And you can find an infinite amount of evidence as you look around the world to justify either choice. Infinite, either way. Yet, both types want to be happy. Of course, because happiness is our ultimate goal. Everything we do is so that we can be happy, if not immediately, then eventually. Often I mean you have to make short-term sacrifices. Just for example, Usain Bolt and Shelley Ann Fraser Price. Oh, by the way, did you hear that she came last in a 200 meters race recently? I mean, this is unbelievable. I have to check that newspaper again. It, there you go, it, it happened. 
Yes, they spend hours and hours of tiring, painful training, short term, so that they can experience the joy of winning. Oh, and the money that goes with it. We were created to be happy. That's why babies and children laugh so much. That's why kittens moving to the animal kingdom, kittens and puppies play so much. It's our natural state. In fact, it is the natural state of our creator. As Emerson put it, I quote, the infinite lies stretched in smiling repose, unquote. We instinctively move towards happiness and happy people, like moths to light. Even the half-empty glasses don't think that something is wrong when they are contented. They know that contentment is normal. Let's see what Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science, says about having a positive, happy approach toward life. I quote, you must learn to have confidence in life, to believe it, to trust it, to have faith in it. And you must come to feel that it returns that love and confidence that as your love goes out to it, its love returns to you, multiplied, just as it does when you love people. For love begets love, confidence inspires confidence, and faith is met with faith." Unquote. Confidence practically pours from the Blue Angels, the US Navy flight demonstration team who, for nearly 70 years, have been thrilling millions annually with demonstrations at air shows. At times, the planes fly in formation just 18 inches apart while traveling at more than 400 miles per hour. After each show, the Pilots have a debriefing during which they critique the demonstration. And as each pilot ends the session, he expresses his gratitude with the words, I am glad to be here. Note the present tense. And please do not, like too many people, promise yourself to be happy in the future as soon as some change comes about in your environment. No. I am happy now. I am glad to be here now. Years ago, I met an otherwise very intelligent man in a shop on Deanery Road down the bottom who swore that he'd not go back to church until President Bush left the White House. True story. And the desire for happiness, oh, not just the individual happiness, but, but for others, motivates the actions of the children in this other anecdote. You may remember it, I've mentioned it. An anthropologist conducting an experiment with the children of an African tribe puts a basket of fruits near a tree and tells the children to race for the fruit. The first one to reach the basket will get all its contents, he says. To his surprise, the children hold hands, run together to the basket, then sit down and eat the fruit together. He's surprised, and he asks them to explain. And the children tell the visitor about the principle of Ubuntu, meaning I am because we are. The children ask him, how can any one of us be happy if anyone is sad? The lesson that we are all dependent on each other, Ubuntu, that we are all one, is a good one. But I want to suggest the only practical action that you can always take 
make yourself happy. That way, you won't be actively preventing others who want you to be happy from being happy themselves. If each person makes it his or her, makes it his or her duty to be happy, then the whole world will be happy. And I repeat, happiness is a choice that you can always make for yourself, but you can never choose happiness for another person. Holmes has this extended definition of happiness in his text, his magnum opus, The Science of Mind. It is, he says, happiness is, I quote, the enjoyment of pleasurable satisfaction attendant upon welfare of any kind. In metaphysics, it means a state of inner peace, a consciousness of the goodness of God and the beneficent attitude of the universe, a realization that joy can come to every man. It has a definite effect on mind, body, and affairs. Let me repeat that. Happiness has a definite effect on mind, body, and affairs. Happiness, he continues, is a state of permanent joy. You see, it is never the will of God or universal harmony that any man should be unhappy. We have a right to any happiness of which we can conceive, provided that that happiness hurts no one and is in keeping with the nature of progressive life. There's a whole talk in that section. But it's in the book, The Science of Mind. Check it out. More proof that the desire for happiness is natural. Babies have it. Animals have it. Proof comes from all sorts of ancient books. I just use the Bible. Some 4,000 years ago, the psalmist wrote, I quote, serve the Lord with gladness come before his presence with singing, unquote. And about 2,000 years later, Jesus told his followers, don't worry about tomorrow, about what you will eat or drink or wear, unquote. He goes on to advise them to be as carefree as life in nature, the lilies of the field, he says, the birds of the air. And he asked the profound question, you warriors, note it, I quote, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life, unquote. He is saying that God will take care of you. I would like you to sing that chorus with me, to, to, with me. God will take care of you. Through every day, in every way, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Valerie, give us the tune, please. Guess what? Some of you just got a blessing from the universe. I wonder if you know who just got a blessing from the universe. I give you a hint. Some of you sang 
and some of you didn't. But it's not that easy. I'm not going to tell you the answer. But it's not that easy, though it might lead you towards the answer. Please think about who definitely just got a blessing from the universe. And you can tell me after. Far from adding a single hour to your life, worrying actually subtracts from your life, which would be bad enough. But worry causes the, the time that you have left to be less healthy than the time that you might otherwise have. So it both cuts the worrying, cuts the number of years you have and minutes, etc., and it also leaves you less healthy. Statistics show that happy people are healthier and live longer, and when they do get ill, their recovery time is shorter. That's what modern science tells us. Experimentally, instinctively, in our hearts, we know it to be true. I'll close with this excellent May 29th essay on happiness by Dr. Carol Kahn. She's one of the luminaries of new thought. She was here some years ago. And she sends a little essay every day, every day to some of us. She, she, she writes, for many people, happiness is a fleeting state dependent on outer experiences that are pleasing to them. If something happens they do not like or approve of, unhappiness is their first line of response. In fact, they will loudly declare, this, so-and-so, makes me unhappy. I know this has happened to all of, unquote, this has happened to all of us. There's a change in our affairs or our environment which we regard as adverse. It may not be, but we regard it, and we become unhappy. But Dr. Kahn says that people who are deeply happy will not become unhappy. People who are deeply happy will not become unhappy because of unwelcome experiences. Instead, they will see those experiences as challenges and immediately move into a creative mode to find solutions. They don't bother with the unhappiness bit. They move to creativity. She says that happiness is the realization of three things. A, our essentially unchangeable nature. B, that our life is eternal, and see that we have immediate access to what we seek. Why do we have that access? Because of our unbreakable, constant relationship with what she calls, I quote, the eternal source